section. First of all, we are going to have evolution of IX in Brazil with a segment of routing a VPN by Fabio Pessoa. After that, abuse of traffic in IXP, how it happens and how to get protected by Douglas Fisher. And then IX platform to, ben to analyze the benefits of connecting to an IXP. And uh, finally, uh, IXP uh, pass uh, that uh, had uh, that Christian Christian O'Flaherty was going to be presented, but as he couldn't come, we uh, he's going to be replaced by Sebastian Wenzel Schoenfeld. which means nice field. Pretty field in German. Uh, I'd like to uh, speak a bit about um, the uh, speakers and then we'll start. Fabio Pessoa Nunes is a magister in uh, electrical engineering and at present uh, he is a network and system supervisor at IX. We are the engineering team, and Douglas Fisher is a control and automation engineer, and he works on telecommunication. Uh, then we have Pedro de Botelio Marcos of uh, the University of Rio Grande, Brazil. Uh, you know Christian O'Flaherty, who is a regional vice president uh, for of, um, uh, uh, like Nick uh, and uh, then Sebastian Schoenfeld, uh, who is uh, um, works for the Internet Society. Each one uh, will come here. We are going to have a back-to-back -back presentations. Everybody is going to have 20 minutes, and at the end of the four sessions, we'll have about uh, 20 minutes, maybe a bit more for questions. So. The questions are going to be at the end, so I would ask you to write down the questions so that we can ask them all at the end. So let's get started with Fabio Pessoa's presentation, Evolution of uh, IXPBR uh, Evolution uh, to uh, SRV6 EVPN. So, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Fabio, and I work with the IXBR engineering group, uh, and I've been there for 11 years. I want to tell you a bit about uh, the uh, networks that we are promoting for segment routing uh, V6 uh, with EVPN. Here we have the agenda. We are, I'm going to tell you who we are, the challenges that we face in uh, the networks, and how EVPN can improve uh, um, overcome those challenges and how you how segment routing IPv6 uh, that is uh, SRV6 uh, uh, how can it create a simpler and resilient network and uh, finally the, the cases and conclusions so IXBR is a project uh, it, it's a group uh, of uh, Internet Exchange of Brazil that facilitates the communication the, the, the direct interconnection between different networks on the internet, the uh, ISP, CDNs, uh, government organizations and companies, and we promote uh, the Im improvement of uh, connectivity between the networks and, this, and to uh, enhance stability and development of the internet in Brazil. This is a project that is maintained by Nick BR. It uh, is a non-profit and it provides uh, the stability and development of the internet in Brazil. At present, we have 38 IXPs in uh, across Brazil. They are not interconnected. 
And uh, the Sao Paulo IXP today is uh, the largest in the world with the number of participants connected and also the volume of traffic that is exchanged every day. We have about uh, 2,700 ASNs connected to IXBR in Sao Paulo that use about 3,000 routers. And we reach 25.6 uh, terabits uh, per second at the historical peak. Now, all this great volume of participants, all this transit, um, lead us to think of new technologies and further developing our networks so as to improve the quality of service increase scalability and capacity that is available for our participants. Now, the uh, IXP networks, despite the fact that very they may sound uh, simple, not always that is the case. Traditionally, the uh, IXPs are two layers, have two layers that um, and uh, they uh, the layer two has characteristics that make it difficult to scale them up as the networks increase you have more and more problems so traditionally Mac, um, the uh, layer two networks learn Mac in the data plane, but I can't assure that all the machines in the network may have the same uh, TCAM table with the same data. That is that all the Macs are updated in all of the machines. So when a machine doesn't have that information, then it's, uh, um, then depending on the scale, uh, this, this may cause problems. Now, to improve uh, the resilience of these networks that are coming in, what we can usually do is using VPLS. And there, we increase the uh, network intelligence. And um, the problem is uh, maintained using, but using a VPLS provides more resilience and intelligence. And there are other complications in the network. And for instance, we need to guarantee that when we operate, they are properly balanced. Likewise, when the, uh, well, my machine needs to be able to be inside the packet in the payload to have an adequate hash between uh, several links. Or also, um, it should use a mechanism such as flow transport to be able to specify the flow that is going through that machine and having an adequate flash between the links, um, recognizing, uh, collecting all the devices in the network. So this is an additional um, uh, advantage and usually we need to use it. The, usually IXPs require a very fast network convergence of uh, this uh, traffic transport and the MAC uh, tables. So if we have any problems, you need to be able to update it. Uh, um, the path and the MAC table need to be updated uh, as soon as possible to uh, re um, uh, direct the traffic, so there is no native uh, path to have redundancy in the network. So you need to be based uh, on an, uh, on MPLS to have a fast reroute. That is a quick way of rerouting and having a more faster convergence. Another challenge of the IXPs has to do with uh, broadcast, uh, multicast, and anycast. Uh, anycast. And here we have to consider that with the volume of with the number of machines that we have in these networks of the IXPs, 
These challenges typically get multiplied and they increase and they become a large scale, especially when we have IPs that are very large. So this uh, broadcast uh, is uh, in an ARP network, and this brings about very serious problems because the number of ARPs that uh, ARPs that are being generated are processed by all participants' routers. So that will go to the participant uh, router. It goes up to uh, the uh, RSP and. Uh, then it will decide whether to give a response or not to that uh, ARP. So the more participants in the n network, more ARPs are we going to have and more problems. So sometimes the participants will configure a uh, very low uh, ARP timeout, and that will uh, further increase the problems in the network for all participants. It can also be the case that a participant left uh, um, without uh, suddenly, and uh, the others are trying to reach it forever with uh, sending requests, and that further increases the number of ARPs uh, in the network. Another serious problem may be that someone may try to uh, do it. ARP trying to pretending to be another participant and uh, that will also cause problems that would be a very serious problem too then with uh, the neighbor discovery there's a similar problem the nature of multicast helps uh, uh, reduce the problem with CPUs and uh, the routers because not all of them will process uh, with neighbor discovery then with unicast, uh, this is also something natural networks of this kind. But in this case, we can consume the entire uh, traffic, all the band available for the participant between the IXP and the router. Usually, this is due to a flaw in our network. For instance, if there's a machine that unexpectedly leaves the network, we have a problem in our machines. All the participants will leave the network and will have to uh, reroute that traffic elsewhere, and that's a very serious problem. It may also be the case that a participant all of a sudden may decide that they're going to leave or have problems in the transport. and. This uh, traffic that was uh, for that participant will finally uh, spill over the rest of the network. How can we help with these problems that we have? EVPN generates a virtualized uh, Ethernet uh, network in our network, and this occurs based on an IP or an MPLS. Here we use BGP as a control plane to create the services between PES and uh, PES and uh, the uh, different uh, IPs in the network. So we are going to announce all the MACs that uh, are considered uh, for all uh, these. Uh, um, so I assure you that all the specific services will have this connectivity between them uh, in the service, and I also guarantee that all the Macs that we will have in one point of the network is known by all the rest of uh, the points in the network. There will be no differences in between any of uh, the uh, machines in the network, and that helps uh, scale up the network, the IXP network, and both the number of the services that we can create and the number of maps that we can have in the second uh, layer. So this also helps us enhance visibility because it helps us know with absolute certainty what are the MAC addresses of the participants because each router knows the origin. This allows us to generate the convergence very rapidly in the event of having any issues or also in the event of any changes to the network. Additionally, we can very easily disable the entire end on cast. Once we are aware of where the participants are in the web network, we can simply tell the router not to use unicast, because if that MAC is not in the network, and not everything is in the BGP table, it does not exist, or at least it's not in the network, so you don't have to do that for all. So once you go back 
to the network, you can send a packet and then everyone will be up to date so as not to generate normal addressing. This migration from NPLS network is a very straightforward migration. There are specifications to be able to maintain the technologies rotating and we'd have EVPN once the path is available. Furthermore, the IXP can use something that is called proxy ERP ND for an EVPN, which is RFC 961, 9161. So those who are in this IXP network will consider the ARP entries of the services we have in layer two. All those ARP requests, uh, all those neighbor solicitations will be contained in that BGP tables. They will be populating that network. So with that information, whatever other participant in the network receiving an ARP request for an IP address that is already on the BGP table, may respond to that ARP request locally without the need of doing the flat for all the devices in the network. It is also necessary to discover where that destination is. So that is something that is quite interesting. This will help us to reduce unnecessary ARP request and the ND request so we can provide a better service to the participants without the need of affecting the router with such a large number of ARPs. Furthermore, when we use static and static static entries in this table, as per RFC 9047, this generates for the entire table and for the, all the peers in the network something that is called in, immutable flag. This entry appears in another MAC in a dynamic way in another point in the network and ignores that entry in the network. So what we manage to do is to protect uh, router services from anyone doing spoofing in that network. We can also protect ourselves from any other participants. We can do so in whichever way we wish. This is an example of how this proxy ARP ND works. The table is populated with all the ARP NDs, so we'll receive an ARP request or we'll receive a neighbor solicitation. So we can see that that request is not for the network, but all the devices. So the response is received locally in that PE. This is very, very helpful for the network. So with EVPN, we can use MPLS, as I was saying. Now, why? Are we going to use segment routing? This is something new. We are used to the traditional MPLS, but what is segment routing? This is source routing. So it chooses a path based on a list of segment. These segments are contained in the packet. These segments then are an identifier for an instructor contained in that packet. These can be instructions for addressing or also for a specific service representing that packet. Therefore, these segments can be MPLS based. It can be a segment routing MPLS. In this case, those segments will be like stables in the MPLS stack, which will be distributed by the IGP. Or we can also use segment routing v6. This is a list of segments that is encoded in the IPv6 header for that transport between a PE and another PE. 
What are there for the benefits of segment routing? We can simplify the network. It is no longer necessary to have additional protocols like LDP or RSVP to do changes in the labels. We are going to use IGP for exchanging and for forwarding information that is exchanged. Then there is a far easier implementation of traffic engineering using segment routing, and natively it already has a mechanism to avoid micro loops. In that way, we don't have redundant paths for TI LFA. So we have here two types of segment writing. Now, why are we going to select segment routing version 6, SRV6? This is because we just love version 6 and want to put V6 everywhere. But it's not only about that. This is a very new technology, of course. But we consider that SRV6, in addition to having the advantages of segment routing as a whole, additionally is a very simple, extensible protocol that only uses fewer IPv6. The main point that we consider is that our core devices don't need to do know anything about segment routing. They just need to know IPv6, IPv6 routing. It doesn't need to do anything else other than that. Therefore, it is very straightforward to start a migration to a network such as these. A part of our network can be using segment routing and EVPN, and everything is being executed in the service parallel to this. This is very simple to do. And this is also very positive to start with using EVPN, because if you have to wait until you change all the devices to generate that migration, it might take much longer. This is a great advantage for us if we wish to use SRV6. As I also mentioned in the previous slide, this has to do with the link with the devices in the core. This is a, something critical for us. Very often, the core cannot be included in the details of the packet or the MPLS. So we have to guarantee that this has the adequate balance between the links of the various bundles of participants. It can be IPv6, and it is already native, so it uses the flow label field of the IPv6 in order to have this adequate cache in the addressing. So this is something that is straightforward. It is already native. We don't need to have an additional protocol to work on this. As I was saying, this is closely linked to the IPv6 transition. Of course, we wish to continue advancing with IPv6. So without doubt, this will bring about more functionalities. This is a very extensible protocol for IPv6 and will help us very much in the future to have even more functionalities. So it is rather difficult to explain how SRV6 works in a limited number of sites. But to give an idea, here we have the instructions of the readdressing re for this service. Here we use SRV6 with micro segments. There are other options as well. But very rapidly, let me explain how this works. The instructions are inserted in the destination address in the IPv6 header. So you can see here that we have an address. This is the destination address, and we have two instructions, micro-instruction 1 and micro-instruction 2. The first micro-instruction states, take this packet, encapsulate the packet to Ethernet, and forward it to PE2. So all the PEs we have along the path will know that the IPv6 address is that one and will forward it. Once it reaches PE2, it will remove the first instruction because it has already been completed and will then 
execute the second instruction. It said, well, we now have to de-encapsulate the IPv6 header and then do addressing taking the MAC table into account with a specific name. So it's very straightforward. This here we can apply any type of traffic lead. We can tell PE1 to go through PE3, PE4, PE2, and from then it goes to the specific bridge domain. We can precisely do the traffic engineering whichever way we wish. Let us now have a look at our implementation case. Since 2016, we have been working on finding a solution that can meet all our needs. This has been a difficult path, and in fact, in 2017, I made a presentation at LACNOG in Uruguay. There I spoke about the fact that we had three terabit traffic in Sao Paulo. We were already doing tests with MPVN, EVPN, but in 20. 23 finally found a solution to meet all our needs in the IXPR. Um, in uh, uh, February 2024, we decided to change the IXBR of uh, Brasilia to EVPN using uh, MPLS, and then in June 2024, we migrated from MPLS to uh, SRV6. And uh, in August uh, 2024, we enabled the proxy ARP proxy and D in this uh, uh, IXPBR. So what we can tell you is that uh, this was a very simple solution and a very elegant uh, solution in our network, very simply implemented. And in this IXP specifically, we had a network, uh, uh, a traditional layer two with a VPLS, so it was a very uh, s simple solution. Now we are working we, we are capable of protecting the routes, uh, the route servers, uh, IPS. Uh, it's the heart, the very core of an uh, IXP. And uh, the main idea is that all the Macs, the IPs, and uh, the ARP and D uh, uh, entries may be uh, operated uh, in more static way to in the network to protect all the participants. So we've already seen a uh, significant improvement in uh, uh, ARP and D in these networks. So we no longer have a unicast in this network. Here uh, we have an example of uh, the uh, Oh, the amounts that were sent uh, through unicast before and after the implementation. And you can see that sporadically there were some unicast peaks that are traditional, that uh, if a participant leaves the network or something of that sort, we used to have those peaks, but we no longer have them. So as to ARP, it's very, the change is very clear when we enabled that feature. We used to have a, a considerable amount for uh, uh, eggs and, uh, and uh, of requests for uh, for ARP, and we saw that we, when we enabled that feature, there was a significant drop. We still see some peaks because, as I said earlier, we are still using it dynamically, and uh, the participant, if uh, the machine doesn't have that sort of entry, then. Um, it will uh, flag in the network, but uh, we still put it there to improve and to reduce the peaks by, and finally uh, do away with them. And the same thing happens with uh, the proxy ND. It re significantly reduced uh, the amount of uh, peaks in the network, too. So we are going to see. Um, um, I, I wanted to, to show our journey in this type of IXP network. Personally, I see uh, the EVPN as a very adequate uh, solution for IXPs. I don't see any new IXPs happening, implementing the networks without the EVPNs. So 
all of these characteristics of the proxy and D and proxy IRP, those are features that help us uh, solve problems that we typically see. And SRV6 brought a possibility to start with this uh, um, replacement in Sao Paulo today. So now we've already started doing this. and. What we intend to do is that in future months we'll see the fruits of uh, this technology of São Paulo in other IXPs too. So this was all. Thank you. We'll leave the questions for the end. So abuse of traffic in IXPs. We will listen to Mr. Douglas Fisher. Good morning. How are you? Well, I'm going to. Uh, uh, well, I was asked by people that uh, not to speak any Spanish, and my plan was to speak Spanish. So we are going to see what we'll see in the presentation, what is an IXP in, uh, from uh, the perspective of a dummy, somebody who doesn't know anything about it, and to show you that there are things there are wrong things that can be done with a, an IXP, and there are people that uh, have ill intentions. So we, I'm going to give you examples of how to protect yourself from uh, from that. And uh, at the end, uh, and I ask you to please write down your questions, and we're going to answer them at the end. But I want to provoke you, to encourage you to uh, engage in this conversation. So. Uh, who am I? Douglas Fisher. I'm an engineer of control and automation. I am uh, pretty old, not as old as others, but uh, I am pretty old. And what I do is look for problems. When I see that a program uh, is created, I start analyzing it because I know there will be problems and that will grow and will make life much more difficult for us. So I want to detect that from the very beginning, and that's what we are going to discuss today. So the perspective for dummies of an IXP. It's a switch or more switches that are in a domain, uh, a regular broadcast domain, and that has mechanisms for um, uh, VLAN translations uh, using VBS. You don't need to do the translation, as Fabio said, but usually we have a barrier. Uh, so all in the sec same segment, and they talk. And if they don't manage to talk directly one with the other, it's not an IXP, it's an alert. There are some people who say, no, I have an IXP. But you can't establish a session with the other friend. You can't exchange traffic if I don't let them. So that is not an IXP. So you have to request somebody's blessing for exchanging uh, traffic. If you have to do that, that's not an IXP. So there we have another uh, set of tools, that is the route servers, that are excellent in my view, and that make it uh, much easier for the ISPs. They reduce uh, the uh, burden of work. Uh, they the route server is taught uh, the route, and the route server will teach it to the rest inside. And for certain, we have mechanisms to prevent those routes from going through communities. For those of you who don't know this, uh, it's a switch with the same barrier, a same uh, network segment for all, and that's it. And we add, make it more and more complex until we get to this monster that Fabio said. We have to develop many protocols. And here I have an example that I brought where, um, well, here you have uh, the best known. Everybody wants to see 
uh, Met, uh, Traffic, uh, Google, JuiceNet, uh, Netflix, these are among the most uh, uh, commonly mentioned. They have the greatest traffic. Now we are in Asuncion that does not have a direct connection uh, with here. You see that usually they are in big places. I was going to put Sao Paulo, but I said, no, let's, let me put Buenos Aires. So let's take Buenos Aires. Should I speak more slowly? OK. So what happens? In Buenos Aires, we have um, these people here, the domains, uh, the uh, uh, network uh, segments, they're all talking to each other. And we have two, uh, three networks, the Juice Net and the Coffee Net. I was not too creative with the names. And the other one is a son of a bitch. Well, it's just a beach. Don't, don't. Uh... So, um, so there you have the sun at the beach, and uh, everything is okay. It's press. They they have presence in both places. They they talk in each both places. So here they show the routes to the route servers and uh, the volume of traffic that uh, leaves met and then it goes to a switch uh, of uh, all the networks everything is working properly but there the sun in the beach uh, networks discovered a detail and decided to do something strange so let's talk about the possibility of abusive uh, traffic so uh, all those of you operating with the BGP networks, you may have heard uh, of a cold potato, hot potato. Why am I carrying this potato? So uh, why am I downloading this? So here I'm going to show you the one of uh, the Sun and the Beach uh, uh, networks. It has 40 giga traffic in Asuncion. Uh, and what is one of the most expensive things in uh, this uh, process? Paying transport from uh, Asuncion to Buenos Aires, 40 gigas, that's not cheap at all. So what does it do? Well, uh, with a, a one giga transport, it establishes a, a v BGP session in his machine, and it's exactly what I know that happens. So it establishes a one giga uh, station by uh, one giga ports in Buenos Aires in the IXB and puts the router there in Buenos Aires, uh, supported by the IX. They only pay $1,000 for location, and the transport costs an additional $1,000. So instead of paying $30,000 for transportation from Buenos Aires to Asuncion, they will all only pay this. So with the BGP, with the router in Buenos Aires, the design of the routes, and uh, we'll teach the routes to the route servers. But before that, we'll be careful to uh, know that they will show the routes and that uh, do the IXP in Asuncion, and then they will. Well, I was going to pay tribute. I forgot to change this because you are in my heart. And it was the Thomas Lynch net and the Jorge Villa net. So their routes are there. We, here we see the, the, the packets that uh, get there. And uh, after that, it will show, they will show the routes from Asuncion to their route in Buenos Aires. And when they do, in the routing policy, they change the next stop. And, uh, and uh, it will uh, make it in the land of the uh, uh, coffee net and the juice net. So, and everything is wonderful. But uh, its own router will teach the routes to the route servers. And they will teach this to uh, Google, my Facebook, uh, AWS, uh, whoever. And what will happen? The packets will uh, leave Meta 
will go to the layer two switch. From uh, that uh, layer two, uh, the, they will go to the r layer three and the route uh, of Santa Fe Beach, and then it goes back to the IX uh, switch, and then it goes to the coffee net and the juice net. Uh, um, they do the transportation free of charge on a voluntary basis. They, they take it to Asuncion. They deliver it to the router in Asuncion. And so he got his transfer, a free ride. That's very nice, yes? Now, so I may be, um, this is not new at all. This is a story that I've known for 15 years. So what happens? We are, let's take uh, this uh, um, audience as an example. We are good people, and uh, all week I left my computer here on the table because I trusted everybody. I knew everybody was a, a nice person, and nobody would steal it. If I were at a stadium with 3,000 people, the odds of being robbed would be increased. Would I? be able to leave my computer there? No, it would have been impossible. So the larger the uh, um, environment, the more likely it is to have somebody that uh, is, has a bad intention. This is an example of someone that uh, acts of ill faith. So this is uh, the example of someone who has bad intentions. Sometimes some of you might uh, wish to throw things at me, but if I taught you how to do this badly, it's not so that you do the same thing. If you consider doing that, do me a favor, get away from me. I just don't want to talk to you if you want to do these uh, stupid things. So I, if you wish to do these things, I, I want just you to know that these things occur so that you can protect yourselves when this does occur. These are examples of how you can protect yourself from such types of abusive traffic. So first of all, to protect yourself is not to be blind as to what is happening in the network. What I, I mean with being blind to these, I know that there are people who operate networks with significant amounts of traffic. They enter the switch to look at the traffic volume in the interface, and that is unacceptable. So it is also unacceptable that if you have a 10 giga traffic, that you don't have a tool for doing flow analysis. If you don't do flow analysis, you don't know what is happening there. Oh, this is, you don't know whether this is your traffic or someone who is using your a space. So you have to use the flow service in your devices, send it to a flow analyzer, and do regular analysis based on what you have. Or look at the odd traffic that might appear. Do these are these my IP seven gigas in my interface? So what is wrong here? What is happening here? So if you're not doing that, you are bad operators. I don't want you to be bad operators. There are tools out there in the market. You have open source tools that you can use for these analyses. So start by doing that. Then you can also apply some types of protection. I divided this as follows. I divided this into two approaches. One is into the control plane and into the data plane. The control plane is easier, but this is not 100% effective. We cannot be totally sure with this. Now, why is this not so safe or secure? Because you won't be able to guarantee that the incoming routes, the routes that enter the routing table, uh, because when we started the presentation, surely many thousands of changes have occurred in the route table. So looking at the filters, if it's downstream, and when you have two or three ASNs downstream, that is quite easy. But if you have 30 or 40, it's just impossible to control this. 
and that is where you might have problems. And, and the other option is a data plane. The simplest thing to do is doing applying a filter policy with ACL. This is something you apply in the interface. So if the packet that is coming in is not forwarded for my IPs, I just reject it. The same happens with the route filter. This is a bit complicated. There are other tools that are smarter tools. Another one is flow spec, which I will be I won't be speaking about this. And then you have the QoS policy propagation via BGP, which is like the grandfather of flow spec. This is because it we it arrived, and if I can do QoS, it can do other things. And from then on, the flow spec was developed. Now, one of the things that has to do with QoS via BGP is because the devices are expensive. And the more resources, the more basic the resources are, the cheaper. So it's better to find a device that does QoS policy propagation via BGP, but does not do flow spec. This is because the chip allows you to do this. These are more basic chips. The OSs are also more basic and allow you to do this. So you can use an aggregation switch from Juniper or from Cisco that have this function, even older boxes. But they won't have flow spec because this involves many more things. And in fact, how can we solve this then? And I will do like the lazy guys do. I will accept that I copied something. But this is rather like a tribute. In 2009, there was a presentation made by Anna in GTER, organized by Nick.br. And this was described, a description of someone who did a misuse of an educational network. So what a friend of mine said that this, what she did was to invent a resource and then solve this. If you want to stop listening to me, you can watch the video, which will be much better that I will be describing now. There's no mystery, but it can get more complicated. This is a demonstration. We're going to have a table map which associates the route with a routing table. It matches one and the other, and this is quite straightforward. In this slide, you can see the BGP and the next, the F, F, sorry, FIB and the next hop. And if you have that community, check this or that. Of course, this is done with, you have to be intelligence. I don't have a pointer, but you will note that in the declaration of the BGP route, you can do a table map. And in the route map, if it fits to that community, you have to do certain things. So there are three different paths that you can follow. This is applied to the interface. The packet enters, and you can note whether this coincides with the route. Does it have this community? If that is yes, I can mark the COS, which is classification, line, and action. So we classify this, and it will then define that. If that yes map is defined, which is a marker, then this is ruled out. You can do things that are more complex than that, of course. This largely depends on the power we have and the capacity we have. The secret to success lies here. If we have announced a route and the packet coincides with the announced route, then this is accepted. This is something that some of you might be asking. Why not include the QRDF? 
in that scenario so that this can have an interface, but we cannot control all the routes. So it won't be effective because maybe in this very same router, we won't be able to be effective with our control. So I think that this is a very elegant and straightforward and economic way to proceed. This is because we have entry-level switches. They are not that expensive. This is very simple to solve. So that is why I wanted to share this with you. And this is quite interesting because here we start to get lost somehow. We now try to see how we can link some other techniques with others. Here you have some other actions. We have red limit, we have black hole, and things of the kind. I will leave this further for the end. But this was all. If you have any questions, I can answer later. Thank you. Gracias, Rubles. Continuamos. So thank you very much. The next speaker is Pedro Botelo Marcos from Brazil. Good morning. I'm Pedro. I'm from the Federal University of the state of Rio Grande do Sur. And I'm here not to bring any problems and things that have to do with the internal situation of IP, but rather to give you tools to help you with the decision-making purposes. This is developed in the academia together with LACNIC. And another partner we have is Internet Society. And I'm now making the presentation on behalf of that team. Many of you are aware, of course, that Traffic delivery is one of the major challenges we face in the internet. We also have applications that require low latency. We cannot lose packets. We have to deliver things in the best way possible. So with that aim, it is necessary to be able to improve routing and particularly to improve the inter network interconnection with other networks so we have better options for traffic delivery. Traffic exchange points are essential in this process. We have hundreds of traffic exchange points all over the world. Only in the Latin American region, we have more than 100 traffic exchange points available for interconnection. Each of these traffic exchange points offer different opportunities for interconnection. The point is that connecting to a traffic exchange point involves cost. There is a decision-making process to determine the best way and place to do this interconnection, in addition to being aware of what the benefits of that network are in order to connect to the different traffic exchange points before establishing this connection. In order to estimate that, this is no trivial task. Now, why do I say this? This is because we have a demand involving multiple data sets from the IPs. All this data has different granularities, different formats. And in order to collect all this data, we have to use various APIs. We therefore have to learn from each of these APIs in order to collect that those data. And even when we have all these data, we face another challenge, namely how can we obtain relevant information from these data that can help us in the decision-making process? So we are going to, what we're going to share with you today is a platform that is still in the development stage, but we have a preliminary version. And at the end of the presentation, those of you who wish to see a demo can, can come, and I will sh share this with you. So the potential users of this platform are network operators who are the ones who have to decide where they're going to connect. Also, IXP managers who wish to understand what is happening with their own IXPs or with the ones that are close to them, as well as the RIRs to provide connectivity in their own regions. So let us see 
possible use cases. We have four cases. The first use case is an autonomous system that needs to find a better connectivity to a given AS or prefix. Here we have a screenshot of our platform. The network operator will inform which is the ASN the, he wishes to find. You will get a list of the different places to which this autonomous system gets connected to. It will also show whether it is connected to the IXP directly or it is reached through the IXP. We also have the number of profiles originated in that AS, how many ASs are under that specific AS, what is the scope of those prefixes, the number of prefixes, as well as the addressing space where this AS is sending this through the IXP and to which it is doing the propagation. So depending on the AS, prefixes and space vary because of traffic engineering of the operator of this autonomous system. Sometimes our objective is not to find the autonomous system, but a given prefix that is important because it generates large traffic volumes in our network. So we can do the same search taking using the prefix. So we can see where this prefix is available with the ASN that is announced in that prefix in the IXP. And also, what is the path to that prefix as well as the hops? In the future, we'll also be able to measure the latency to reach that prefix so that we can have information on the control plane as well as on the data plane. So this is the second use case. This is when the AS needs to understand if it is worth or not to connect to a new IXP. Here, we're going to select the one of interest, which is Sao Paulo, and we're going to upload our routing table. This routing table shows statistics on the amount of available ASs in the routing table in the IXP. We have the prefixes as well as the addressing space. So this will allow us to observe these metrics and we'll have the general numbers for the IXP for the routing table as well as some comparisons, for example, overlapping between what is available in the routing table of the AS as well as what is available in the IXP in addition to what you can reach through the IXP and what is available only in the routing table of the AS. In addition, we can do some comparisons, for instance, of uh, the addressing uh, space announced uh, by the visible uh, routing tables, both in the autonomous system and the uh, IXP. And so in this case, for instance, we have about 5,000 ASs in our databases. We uh, check uh, whether the space is the same or it differs depending on where we are observing it from. And this uh, shows that there might be a larger space when connecting to that IXP. We're going to do the same thing with the prefixes available in the two places, comparing the size of the prefix to see whether it's uh, larger or smaller or the same. And we we'll evaluate the similarity of the paths uh, seeking for redundancy, because if an autonomous system fails, it may be the case that we may have no routes. So we'll see whether they are very similar or uh, very different, or if there's something halfway. Then we have a third use case, is when we have a network operator or an IXP manager that wants to compare the benefits of the two IXPs and want to see the uh, similarities and differences. We're going to choose two IXPs. We present the statistics on the IXPs as the members of the AS uh, that can be reached, the prefixes announced, uh, the prefix, and uh, the coverage of IXP uh, as in the country. We also have some other general data 
data. And then we have the comparison between these IXPs, as we saw earlier, considering the overlap uh, and uh, the uh, parts that differ and that are the same in each one. We also evaluate uh, the overlay of uh, the prefixes and the size. Here we compare Sao Paulo and Fortaleza. We see that most prefixes have the same size. And we also see when they are available in both places in Fortaleza, it tends to be is, uh, smaller than in Sao Paulo. We also see redundancy. Here we can observe uh, that the autonomous systems that are in both uh, sites and the prefixes in both sites are basically the same in the two cases, that is, that the paths are the same. And there are also some statistics on the size or the distance for each prefix, the, uh, the hops, uh, and the same uh, for the autonomous uh, systems, uh, the size and the number of hops of the XP. And finally, the last two use cases when we have a regional internet registry like LACNIC that wants to see what's happening the XPs in the region. So we select a region, LACNIC, we have the number of IXPs in the region, how many countries are represented in the those IXPs. Here we consider only Brazil. That's why we have only one country in the list. Here we have the number of uh, members in the, the IXPs, the uh, set uh, of uh, AS that we can reach, a spice of addressing, and uh, the coverage uh, of the uh, AS that can be reachable and uh, the uh, addressing space. 20% of the Brazilian ASs uh, are members of at least one IXP from the region. 70% of uh, the Brazilian IXPs are reachable through an IXP from the region, and 31% of a total region address space is reachable through the IXP from the region. We also have some statistics of the members of the ASs uh, separated by region, prefix, and addressing space, also by region or country. And for each of the autonomous systems in the region, we are going to show how many IXPs in the region are connected and how many ASs in the region are reachable, of how many it is a member, and whether it's a member or it's reachable at IXPs from other regions. For instance, here we speak of an IXP of the RIPE region, for instance. And we can do the same analysis considering a particular country or IXP as the reference point. Or one single IXP. So let's see now what's next with this uh, tool that we are developing. We are continuously adding new features, the first of which has to do with uh, the data plane measurements for performance analysis. And now we are only have measurements in uh, the controls and uh, but in the future, we'll have uh, the latency included in this analysis. We also have a longitudinal analysis of our data because at present, we show only our la last uh, data uh, available. So this longitudinal analysis will uh, allow us to see how they evolve in time. And finally, we are also uh, developing an API to allow the community to use our data easily and to build a new analysis to um or to use it in whatever you may need for decision making in traffic engineering my last request is well we need your help um, to give continuity to this work. Especially, we need to receive uh, feedback o on uh, special features that you would like to see in this platform, any kind of analysis that we can improve. And for those of you working with IXPs, we had observation points, and that will be essential for this work, and also to contribute with routing data of IXPs. That will be very important for us to continue with the analysis. This tool is being funded by LACNIC, the Internet Society, and an academic initiative. We are non-profit, and the idea is to make it available later for your own use. So your contributions are essential if you want to improve the tool. If you have any doubts, please contact me here at the event or through that email. Thank you. Gracias, Pedro. Thank you, Pedro. So now the last speaker, and then we'll have time for questions. 
Good morning, everybody. I'm not Christian of Lahati, you may have noticed. I, I, I understand that he's online, so hi, Christian. I hope I do a good job for you. My, I, oh, my intention was to speak uh, Portuguese out of respect, but as I see uh, the faces of Thomas Linger and uh, Ariel, uh, I, I, I decided to uh, give my presentation in Spanish. And the other issue is that I don't have any technical background, so I'll do my best for uh, to, to make this interesting for all of you. Well, the Internet Society, it might not even be necessary to introduce it here, but it's an organization that se seeks to defend uh, the Internet and make it grow in the understanding that it's for all, and that it's a space uh, of opportunities. Whoever wants to connect should be able to do it, and we're interested in about its future. So basically, we work in three pillars. We want, we uh, help uh, make it grow, we defend it, we want to make it stronger, and we give shape to the future of Internet, working with the development of champions that may um, uh, implement these tasks uh, in the world. We seek alliances with all of the organizations that share our vision in Latin America and the Caribbean. We uh, have partnerships with LACNIC and LACAXA to support new IXPs and existing IXPs and uh, to implement uh, best practices uh, and uh, creating new activities. What I'm going to tell you about today is about the IXP tracker. Let us see some of the things that we uh, tell uh, non-technical uh, uh, publics. Uh, what are the advantages of an IXP? Uh, um, well, uh, the fastest route uh, is usually a straight line, but uh, sometimes the, uh, there is no internet infrastructure. Uh, and uh, sometimes in countries, there, the traffic would be very costly and very slow. And uh, it could, uh, um, so, well, they, the IXPs uh, attract investments. They improve uh, the yields, uh, better uh, customer uh, experience. They improve uh, resilience, and uh, they permit, uh, they allow for redundancy. If uh, there's a local network that uh, crashes, then you can uh, use another. In my country, in Argentina, there is. Um, structural reduction of uh, um, uh, uh, international currency, the IXPs, reduce the cost of what you have to pay for Argentina, and that has a direct impact on other aspects of economy. And that's a very positive aspect and a virtuous uh, thing of IXPs that sometimes is not so, uh, is, it's even forgotten because uh, there are not too many countries in the world that have uh, our structural deficits as in Argentina, but I wanted to highlight it anyway. Well, maintaining local traffic uh, brings about some economic uh, consequences that may be beneficial, as I said, uh, and it also reduces uh, the cost uh, of the well, the existence of this infrastructure reduces the cost of transit. And we wanted to improve this model because of all these reasons, because we want the IXPs to thrive around the world. And it is with that in mind and uh, to support uh, an enabling uh, environment for these actions that we need to explain uh, these benefits clearly with transparency, with giving figures and charts to people who do not necessarily understand the technical variables of an AXP. So in our platform of measurements in Pulse, uh, we, we invite you all to visit it, to get familiar with it, and to use it. We launched this new IXP tracker that seeks to be able to show an aggregated and historic uh, way and uh, clean uh, the data of uh, the uh, RX, 
uh, the internet in a certain country. So this shows you the traffic that is circulating through the IXPs in a country, how many are active and how they developed and how that situation uh, came about. Imagine this conversation as somebody in, uh, in an organization like mine or LACNIC, we have to talk to, to public policy, um, makers, you, this gives you very clear um, and uh, simple information that may support you as you have your discussions. That's the aim of that tracker. This tool was possible thanks to the collaboration. Well, we try to strengthen uh, this uh, tracker. We want everybody to use it, to use it critically, to give us your feedback. And in the technical communities, we assert for commitment of the regional stakeholders exchanging knowledge and best practices. As I was telling you, for public policy makers, we want uh, to develop a policy promoting open markets and uh, regulatory processes that may make it possible for AXPs to grow and in our uh, society to uh, propose uh, to increase uh, capacity building and promote peering. Just to give you an example of how the IXP tracker works, the uh, ecosystem state of IXPs in Paraguay shows us that there are two active IXPs. 23% of the traffic that goes through the IXPs in our country, in this country, and also how it has developed with how the traffic has uh, developed. Uh, the, tr the traffic that exchanged uh, in this point of pause allows you to see that in each country, and also in a re country re you can see it in a country report that shows uh, very quickly the key variables of uh, the status of the internet in each country in the world, which is a very useful thing. I insist in the importance of collaboration and a call to the community of LACNIC and LACNOG and to use this tool with a critical thing because everything, uh, we it is through feedback that we can make adjustment to things that are not reflected because of different reasons. This is the country report that I mentioned that allows us to see how many people are using the internet, depending on the population density, the index or the score of resilience in the network, the level of concentration that a market can have, the market readiness, how many providers there are and how they are dis how the service is distributed in the country so that would be all this was a brief presentation and i'm happy to take any questions or comments but once again we invite you we invite those who are not members of the Internet Society to do so and also to use these tools that are there for this purpose and also to improve everyone's situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. We have about 10 minutes for questions. I'd like to ask the speakers to come up. There's always some, already someone queuing up for questions. Hola, buen día. Good morning. To our friend from ISOC, the percentage you saw regarding percent of local traffic through the traffic exchange point, could you please tell us the methodology you choose to estimate that percentage? I didn't quite grasp that. Thank you. So to be completely frank, I would be incapable of explaining the methodology but maybe Christian, if you are in the Zoom session, could you ask the answer remotely? Yes, are you there, Christian? Okay, Christian will be explaining this. The documentation on the methodology is available on the Pulse website, so you can read that and check it, check that out there. 
Hi, Chris. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. One of the things that I wanted to clarify is that the ISOC collects the information and also uses other organizations. Oops. The, uh, this has been done with our own collection. There are many partners. And in order to decide how much is local traffic, if you look at the partners, one is Peering DB, which is what the participants in the IXPs have there as their announcements. And you will also see that there are others, for example, PCH, that has route collectors that are public, and they share this information. So. What Pulse does and what the ISP tracker does is to combine the measurements from different sources and then to present this in a useful way. So to answer your question, the f rapid answer is what is documented by the participants and also what you see in the collectors that do the route collection. Thank you, Christian. I have two questions. One is for Fabio. What bandwidth? You showed us graphs, and it said 200, but I don't know whether these were megas or gigas. Creo que 10 segundos. No, salió entrecortada la respuesta, perdón. Uh, for Sebastian and Christian, the cost of transits drop, drop, and continue to drop. And in other regions, such as in Europe or in the United States, they can be compared to the cost of connecting an IXP. Do you think that that is something that we'll be seeing in this region, and what would be the effect of that? Christian? Two answers to that question. First, the information there is available to do research and find trends. That is a very good example of trends that you can see in other regions and that we could see in our region return. So I invite researchers to use the information of Pulse and IXP Tracker to see things such as those. Now, regarding the value of the IXPs and the use thereof, to tell the truth, this is something that whose value has always, always changed. Initially, the most simplest equation was costs and also to show that no traffic was international traffic was saved so connecting and using the last mile to connect to the IXP that then things changed the value equation changed over time so it might be that for a major ISP that hires a lot of value then the cost equation does not justify the connection to XP people. So it might also occur that it finds other advantages in addition to that of cost. And in addition to that, for the smaller ones who don't hire such a large volume and who don't have those convenient costs, it is still justified to have the connection to the IXP. So it is quite true that on that in that sense, the value or the use could start to decrease, but I'm confident that there will be other justifications and that the use of IXPs 
will continue to make this grow. It will continue to be valuable. A question for Pedro. In your tool, do you also take into account the geographical location of the ASNs, for example? In the state of Ceará in Brazil, there are 1,000 autonomous systems, but only 500 are connected to the IXP of Ceará. Would you include that in the tool to encourage those content providers or other networks to invite those autonomous systems to get connected in order to have traffic? Did you take that into account? Yes, we can do that, but the point is that we can have access to the autonomous systems in each of the states because the files we use to do the estimations of those of the ASN assignments and for the prefixes we use a max mind basis. But for the ASNs is through the assignment region and there you have this country but not each state. If we could have access to a database describing which other states, we could add that information, of course. First of all, congratulations. This was an excellent panel. Now, my question is the following. This is something that we have discussed on several occasions. And namely, if we take an, into account the service six, we could go to IP6 only ISP fabrics, even though they go through IP4 transit through IPv4. I didn't understand your question, Carlos. Can you repeat your question, Carlos? To use uh, next hop for the IPv4 traffic, is that what you mean? Well, for the time being, we didn't consider that. This is a different type of problem that we are trying to figure out a solution to. But it is most likely, and in fact, we often have those increases in the prefix in our domain, in our v4 domain, that we separate IPv4 from IPv6. So this is something that we are always worried about, namely to find the amount of IPs available for IPv4. So it is likely that this is something that is always there in our minds, but we still haven't focused on that constantly. Let me add a brief comment for Pedro. The IXPR does have this. This is in the website. If you look at the map of the ASNs of IXPR, this answers what Flavio re asked regarding Netflix. You have the city and you have the state where the headquarters are of that ASN. So you can do that triangulation. And I think the IX has all the mapping of that. Hello, good morning. I'm from Brazil and we Kupin. The question regarding V6 segment routing, the option of including micro segmentation in the addressing, was this due to the devices along the path that didn't speak the V6, they didn't read the header, the extension header of the segment routing, or was this for some other reason? And the second question is all the policies on traffic engineering. Are you doing this by Y series or are you are using an automation tool? To answer your first question on using micro segments, one of the recommendations that we had, and we always speak with everyone to get feedback or comments, we were told uh, that the trend is to use that st as a standard. So although this is something quite new, we try to be a step ahead so as not to change this in the future. But as far as I'm aware, it would be there would be no problem in using the segment routing header. So it would be in the same way. This would be an IP normal IPv6 addressing between the ends. So the V6 segment routing would be the one who should understand the seg header. 
because even if in the middle it doesn't speak a segment right and you can have the policy well that was my question the issue of policies we are we have very specific cases of traffic engineering that are not so common so this is not something that we do very frequently traffic engineering already shows the benefits so this has to do with a protocol but we don't have the need of creating rules on a daily basis you don't have to make it go through that path and that is why we don't have an automation policy so far so thank you very much He's not using microphone. <laughs> 